the sound waves travel through the canal of our ear, they hit the tympanic membrane or eardrum and cause it to vibrate. This vibration prompts movement in the ossicles, a trio of tiny bones that transmit the vibration to a structure called the oval window, which sits in the wall of the cochlea. The cochlea is a tiny coiled structure in the inner ear that resembles a snail shell. The interior of the cochlea consists of three fluid-filled canals that run parallel to one another. The scale of vestibuli, the scale of media, and the scale of tympani. The scale of vestibuli and the scale of tympani contain a fluid called perilymph, and the scale of media contains a fluid called endolymph. When the oval window is depressed by the ossicles, it creates waves that travel through the fluid of the cochlea. These waves cause a structure called the basilar membrane to move as well. To visualize the function of the basilar membrane, it can be helpful to imagine the cochlea uncoiled. When waves flow through the fluid in the cochlea, they create small waves within the basilar membrane itself that travel down the membrane. Different sections of the basilar membrane respond to different frequencies of sound, and as the waves progress down the membrane, they reach their peak at the part of the membrane that responds to the frequency of the sound wave created by the original stimulus. In this way, the basilar membrane accurately translates the frequency of sounds picked up by the ear into representative neural activity that can be sent to the brain. The translation of the movement of the basilar membrane into electrical impulses occurs in the organ of corti, which is the receptor organ of the ear. It sits atop the basilar membrane and contains receptor cells known as hair cells. Hair cells are so named because protruding from the top of each cell is a collection of small hairs called stereocilia. When the basilar membrane vibrates, this causes the movement of the hair cells in their stereocilia. Movement of the stereocilia opens ion channels and causes the release of neurotransmitters to propagate the auditory signal to the vestibulocochlear nerve, which will carry the information regarding the auditory stimulus to the brain to be analyzed and perceived. It's all a bit confusing, isn't it? <laughs> um, it's supposed to be a big projection there, it's also making it a bit easier to understand. But the projector's not playing ball at the moment, so you can come back. Um, but other than that, welcome to my show. It is so lovely to have you here. For the next 45 minutes, we are going to be looking at how cool sound and music really is. So I'm going to start off with sound. Sound is integral to our day-to-day -day lives. For instance, the presence of it, aka the my alarm goes off in the morning. I know I've got to get up for work, and you know, I don't want to do that. I mean, I've got to do other stuff. Also, the absence of sound is important, aka when my alarm doesn't go off in the morning, I'm thinking, oh, I've just got a day off, it's always a good thing. But I'm going to move on now to music, or rather, organised sound. I didn't come up with that term, someone else did, but I think it sounds really cool, so I'm going to use it today. Um, music is completely subjective, isn't it? For some people, they're like, classical music is the best thing ever. They're like, give me Bach, give me Beethoven, give me Franz Schubert. And I'm thinking, nah, give me Backstreet Boys, give me Beyonce, <laughs> give me Franz Ferdinand. But we might not both agree on music, but we do seem to have a collective understanding of it. So if you hear someone singing and it's a bit out of tune, we all get it, we all hear it and think like, oh, not sound right. And also when we hear a song that we all know, we get when it's being played a bit too fast or a bit too slow. And when you're watching a scary movie and you see someone walking down the street and you hear the violin start screeching away, you don't think, oh, they're just going for a lovely, calm walk. You know that something bad is going to happen, right? Someone's going to jump out and get them. So, despite the fact we don't all agree on music, it does have the power to convey pretty powerful messages. Now, the basic elements of any sound are loudness, pitch, contour, duration, tempo, timbre, spatial location, and reverberation. Our brains organise these fundamental perceptual attributes into higher level concepts, just as a painter arranges lines into forms, and these include metre, harmony, and melody. When we listen to music, we are actually perceiving multiple attributes or dimensions. The difference between music and a random or disordered set of sounds has to do with the way these fundamental attributes combine and the relations that form between them. When these basic elements combine and form relationships with one another in a meaningful way, they give rise to higher order concepts such as meter, key, melody, and harmony. The idea of primitive elements combining to create art 
and on the importance of relationships between elements also exist in visual art and dance. The fundamental elements of visual perception include colour, which itself can be decomposed into the three dimensions of hue, saturation and lightness, brightness, location, texture and shape. But a painting is more than these. It is not just a line here and another there, or a spot of red in one part of the picture and a patch of blue in another. What makes this set of lines and colours into art is the relationship between this line and that one, the way one colour or form echoes another in a different part of the canvas. Those gaps of paint and lines become art when form and flow, the way in which your eye is drawn across the canvas, are created out of lower level perceptual elements. When they combine harmoniously, they give rise to perspective, foreground and background, and ultimately to emotion and other aesthetic attributes. Similarly, dance is not just a raging sea of unrelated bodily movements. The relationship of those movements to one another is what creates integrity and a coherence and cohesion at the higher levels of our brain process. And as in visual art, music plays are not just what notes are sounded, but which ones are not. Miles Davis famously described his improvisational technique as parallel to the way that Picasso described his use of a canvas. The most critical aspect of the work, both artists said, was not the objects themselves, but the space between objects. In Miles's case, he described the most important part of his solos as the empty space between notes, the air that he placed between one note and the next, knowing precisely when to hit the next note and allowing the listener to anticipate it. Loudness is a purely psychological construct that relates non-linearly and in poorly understood ways to how a human creates, they create much air at displayed displaces, and what an acoustician would call the amplitude of a
pretend that we have an idea of how sound travels to the ear. But what exactly is sound? Sound is, again, pressure waves traveling through a medium. So let's unpack that a bit. Think of yourself as a tiny molecule in a line, right? There's a molecule over here, there's a molecule over there. You're just hanging out. And then all of a sudden, the guy next to you bumps into you, and you're like, what? And then you accidentally bump into the person on your left, right? And then, oh, gosh, again, you get hit from the right, and you go back to the left, and again, faster this time, and then lightly at first but then in increasing intensity. Then you're just vibrating back and forth and you're all just bumping into everybody and then all of a sudden it subsides and then it comes back and then you're bumping and then it subsides again and then, oh, that's sound. It's molecules hitting each other and passing the energy from one little bit to the next little bit in that medium. Uh, like the molecular version of the wave in a baseball stadium. But instead of the wave going around every couple of minutes, it's multiple waves per second. It's a lot. Pressure waves. Go.
Random Bell by Yes is my dad's favourite song. And I have some pretty great memories attached to that song too. Uh, when we were kids, uh, we had this caravan uh, down in Suffolk and we would drive down there uh, basically every weekend, most summer holidays as well. And um, I hear that song and I'm just transported back 20 years. I'm sat in the back of my dad's car, more specifically on the left hand side of the back. If you have siblings, you'll know that you have specific areas in the car, that's just the rules. Um, and I would always climb on to the side of the door and look out of the window um, as my dad sped down the road. Away. And I, he did speak, I think that's why I held on, because I was like, I should something. Um, but it was for a good reason. Because as we would get to the caravan, we would approach this one particular road called the Hilly Road, very aptly named because of the hills. Um, and we would be coming up to it, we'd be like, come on, Dad, like, floor it, like, really go for it. And we would honestly go flying down this hill. And I'm pretty sure at some point we would actually be airborne, flying through the air. And it felt amazing. But yeah, I just hear that song, and I'm just keeping it back there, and it makes me feel so good. Music is subjective, 
but my sister does have the best taste in music. She just has this ability to make these amazing playlists, and everyone loves them. Like, every time we have a family gathering or a party, Emma is in charge of the music. She even brings her own speaker, it's great. <laughs> and we had this one particular New Year's Eve party, and of course, she was in charge of the music, and it was such a good playlist. We were dancing so much, like jumping up and down, in and down, as hard as we can. And that was she couldn't walk the next day. Her heart had frozen up. And it wasn't funny, which was very funny. <laughs> Having to shuffle around after, I was like, it's hard. But it was completely worth it. Anyway, I digress. We had this party, amazing music, and that song you just heard, Dance Apocalyptic, came on. And I thought, oh, this song is amazing. I just wanted to do stuff with it. And that's the first time I created any sort of choreography or movement to music. And I've just been doing it since then. And I think I had my sister, I guess, to that. She just lit that spark that I needed. Yeah, 